Hey guys, this is Billy from AdultCello.com and today I want to talk about three cello myths that nobody talks about specifically for adult learners. So if you're new to this channel, uh, I'm a professional cellist who started at the age of 25 from scratch. And so what I do now is I try to help other adults who found the cello later in life like I did. And if this video is helpful for you, please go ahead and subscribe. All right, so myth number one is that precise equals careful. Let me unpack that. As an adult learner, especially something like the cello, we're aware that we want to be free and open and musical and like sound our best. And we're also aware that, you know, a millimeter in either direction puts us out of tune and we have to use exactly this amount of bow and blah, blah, blah. So it, there's a high degree of precision with cello playing. However, the problem is that it doesn't, at the end of the day, you can't sacrifice your freedom of movement for precision. So you don't want to end up careful when you play. You just want to be precise. Easier said than done. For me personally, when I was, you know, still to this day, to be honest, I there's always this kind of little war going on between me just like opening up and letting go and trying to like sing my heart out on cello and have really just beautiful bow strokes with but big arm muscles, you know, not like real finicky, careful. And then the, on the other side, there's me trying to be completely precise. I need to do this with my fingers. I need to do this for my bow change. Like, and I've gone back and forth um, in my journey. If you haven't, you probably will. It's just one of these things that really just takes a lot of time to figure out how to strike a good balance between letting go in terms of like these big gestures and motions and like breathing while you play stuff like that and then on the other hand making sure that you end up in exactly the place on the bow that you expected to be you know the, i think one of the first major things that occupies your mind once you've been playing for a little bit is just getting more and more kind of flexible fingers and getting the, that sort of paintbrush, hand st bow stroke, stuff like that. That's where I first kind of started creeping into that overly careful, is I was just getting more and more obsessed with the smallest muscle groups I have, like my fingers and what they do and all these things, and then I'm gonna measure out exactly this much bow. It, it's all good to a point, but at the end of the day, it's going to sound careful when you're playing if you're being careful when you play. I think I've made my point, but I'll give one little analogy. Uh, it's kind of like I went horseback riding when I was a kid, and for there were you know a bunch of different horses in the stable, and I when it was my first day, so they gave me this horse that was so old and tired, and it was great because I just sit on this like moving couch. There was like no way anything bad was going to happen. This thing barely moves, and it you know it actually just drank water like half the time. I couldn't even get it to, it was really thirsty. But the thing is, that to me is kind of like being overly careful, is you're just settling in for this plodding, slow, unexciting ride. And then there's like that other horse where we like, we just got a saddle on this thing yesterday. If you can tame this thing and kind of ride and sink with it, you're gonna have the most exhilarating day of your life you might get bucked off though that's kind of like what I'm talking about where you are pushing the limits and trying to really like use your body to make big free motions you're gonna miss shifts you're gonna miss things certain times but I think it's better to really focus on freeing yourself up than to just get smaller and smaller with precision this is kind of why in my teaching which is focused solely on adults I, I really I do very much work on you know the technique and the, the ergonomics and the what your body's supposed to be doing but i i really tie in a lot of exercises that where you're kind of letting go in a sense and just trying to feel what your body would naturally do ergonomically i think that's a huge thing for adults because uh, you know our bodies if we listen and we ask the right questions in the right way it, our bodies will tell us what's natural for us to do instead of us kind of solving it backwards by okay i've learned these concepts and now i've got this mental image of what my arm should like should feel like maybe should look like and i'm just going to go from there with like my brain first so cello myth number one yes you need to be precise but try not to be too careful all right myth number two a straight bow should feel linear okay so 
it's kind of a complicated situation we have, but you know, if you look at pulling a straight bow, we, you know, from day one basically we learned that a straight bow just means parallel to the bridge. And we learned that because nothing is straight when you're playing cello. The fingerboard is curved, and so you end up doing all these kind of funky three-dimensional angles. But yet, we still, a lot of adults, I think, kind of see the bow stroke as, okay, maybe it's going to be a little hooked or a little, you know, curved in, in a funky way. But essentially, I'm just pulling the bow across the string in a straight line, okay, parallel to the bridge, like this. And I think that's one place where we lose a ton of beautiful, rich sound by doing that. Um, so let's just do a little exercise, all right? I want you to try this. So you're gonna take the bow with both hands, okay? So obviously we'll be playing an open string because you don't have a third hand, all right? And we're gonna go ahead and go on the A string and just try your best to keep uh, the bow stroke parallel to the bridge, okay? and then just run with both hands touching at all times. So you're just gonna run it back and forth. Basically, if you could just draw a straight line in a three-dimensional plane. Okay, that's not a bad sound at all, okay? Because it is parallel to the bridge, so you're not, you know, you're not breaking any rules technically. But now what I'd like you to do is start and as you bow you're going to start turning you're going to start rotating the bow this way as you pull so as you sink in you're basically gonna to me i think of the curve of the fingerboard and i'm just going to go in the opposite way and my hand's going to go out away from me okay so it's it's a little bit of this included so now <laughs> that first off I actually have to like be careful I don't sink in too much because there's all this added power and it's because you're just basically even when you get out here by turning the bow outwards like my right hand's going further from my body it's just I'm getting more and more torque even out here whereas if I'm just dragging it along you know the further my hand gets from my body it just feels weaker and weaker so by Thinking of the bow as nonlinear, or as basically every bow stroke you do is going to be curved in some, to some extent, and also that the stroke itself is going to have some element of the, like a U shape into it. Okay, so if you, instead of just, that's like I took a marker and I just drew a straight line, is how it feels, versus if I go, and I'm, what I'm doing is going light and then sinking in with weight and speed and then lightening up again. I think a lot of us leave a lot of tone and richness on the table because the more you kind of sink in with that sort of passive weight, that's the, that's the thing that's really going to open up the cello, not just in terms of volume, but like richness, which means overtones and kind of like a, a very broad open sound. Okay, and so for our number three myth, we're gonna talk specifically about shifting. And the myth is fast is fast, okay? So what I mean by that is that if you want to play a, you know, a shift either on a bow change or in a slur, and you want it to be really smooth, you're gonna to have to move your hand quickly so that there's no gap in the sound. What I've found, what is true for cello is that slow is fast actually okay so i i've heard this before i i love this saying is that the sh the kind of the type of motion you make with either hand is gonna kind of tell you what type of sound you make so a jerky motion with the bow is like that you're gonna have a jerky sound a slower kind of a, a more rounded sound, uh, rounded motion, you're gonna have a rounded sound. That's a really important concept when you think about shifting, especially, and I'm talking pretty much about legato shifting where you're trying to mask 
the fact that you have to stop the sound and move your hand. So let's take a, a shift. I'll go from B to E on the A string. So, as you can see in the version, <laughs> the two versions, one, I moved very slowly, but honestly, there was not a break in sound because the shift itself becomes part of the old note. The second way, um, I was basically, this is the myth I had before, was that I thought, okay, I need really legato, which means there's no break. So I need to hold on to the last note as long as possible, boom, and get to the next note at basically the speed of sound. And then th that will, there'll be no break because, uh, ah, you know, like that. So the problem is, of course, that first off, just doing that, even if your bow didn't kick as well, it's almost guaranteed to put some kind of weird accent on the on the shift itself. And worse is that our two hands are connected by one brain, which we all have, hopefully one brain. And that, so therefore you, when you scoot your left hand really fast, usually you'll end up scooting in the bow as well. And so you get something like that. And you end up with a really big kick. You know, when it dawned on me and when my teachers, what they'd been saying finally clicked, I thought, okay, I want it legato, I want it connected. So I have to arrive on time because I need the new note to happen when it's supposed to happen. It's not allowed to land to happen late, you know, rhythmically. So if I need to arrive on time, but I need time to get there slowly, I have to borrow from the old note, rhythmically speaking. So that that's kind of the solution. It takes practice because there's like this, especially for adults, I think, we get this like, really intense like nervousness that like I need to get there but here's the exercise I'll go ahead and give you you're gonna we're gonna do kind of like a slide whistle type of deal with the shift we'll do from B to E same one I just did and you're gonna go back and forth and you're gonna try deliberately to match the speed a, a slow speed going up and the same slow speed going back so <laughs> So what, and what your bow is doing, it's just not stopping for sure because a stop, a stop in the bow is going to cut the sound. So your bow has to keep going, but it really slows down and it lightens up basically as much as you don't want to hear that shift. If you want to hear the whole scoop, you just keep the bow in the string. If you want to hear less of it, you just slow the bow down a little bit more and take a little bit of weight out and you'll hear less of the slide. But you will have now a legato connection. So if you wanna really kind of try to develop a sense of how to do this, one thing I did was I would actually do it like with a metronome and I would make say the, the quarter note is 50 or 60, something like that, and it's a slow metronome marking. And then I would purposely leave like I, if something was a quarter note and then a shift, I would play for like an eighth note and then the second eighth note of that quarter note, I would dedicate to shifting slowly. All right, so myth three, the answer, the true answer for cello playing is that slow is fast when it comes to shifting and we uh, adult learners have to just get over this concept or this feeling of I'm late, I gotta get there really fast, as quickly as possible. So there you go, that's three myths about cello playing, especially tailored to adult learners that I tried to debunk for you today. Um, if you found it helpful, please let me know in the comments below and I'll see you next week.